night we present the final part of our investigation into Merseyside's most baffling murder case, the killing of Julia Wallace in Anfield in 1931. Although her husband, William Herbert Wallace, has been freed on appeal, most people are still convinced that he is the murderer. But doubt has crept into the case with hitherto undisclosed evidence about a second suspect, Richard Gordon Parry. Tonight's programme, Conspiracy of Silence, is presented by Roger Wilkes. Tonight, you will hear a story that is as disturbing as it is astonishing. It is told in his own words by a man who is now 74 years old. He's told his story before, but privately to friends and members of his family, none of whom has any reason to doubt that the story is true. Fifty years ago, in 1931, he told it to the Liverpool police. He did so, he says, out of a sense of conscience and public duty, because it seemed to him at the time that the life of an innocent man was at stake. The police chose not to believe his story. Tonight, John Parks tells his story in public for the first time. Tonight, you have the opportunity to judge it for yourself. When you have heard it, consider the proposition that at last this could be the final solution to the Wallace case. In January 1931, John Parks was 24 and living with his mother in a cottage in Tinwald Hill, Stonycroft. He worked as a cleaner and general dog's body for two pounds a week at an all-night garage in nearby Moscow Drive, not far from its junction with Green Lane. This was, and still is, known as Atkinson's Garage. The owner, Mr William Atkinson, had three sons, Wilfred, Harold and Arthur. All the Atkinson menfolk worked in the business, and John Parks, because of his age and the fact that he lived just a stone's throw away, was considered very much one of the family. They called him Pucker. He was well thought of by the Atkinsons, a good worker, honest, industrious and punctual. Young Parks worked nights. His hours were roughly from 11 at night until 9 or 10 the following morning. Life as an all-night garage hand was no soft touch, but in 1931, one man in four in Liverpool was out of work and John Parks was grateful for the security afforded in the service of Atkinson's garage. It was a big place for those days and a busy one. As well as the business generated by private customers, the firm operated a fleet of taxis, and these would need constant maintenance, servicing and cleaning. At night, the garage became something of a social centre for some of the customers, because the Atkinsons had a flat above the garage, and certain clients would often drop by for a late-night chat and a drink in the kitchen. Some of the clients were welcome there, others less so. Among this last group was Richard Gordon Parry, he lived a couple of streets away in Woburn Hill. Twenty-two years old, dapper and suave, he was known in the neighbourhood as something of a wide boy. John Parks had known Parry for several years. They'd been at school together in Lister Drive, but the relationship had never quite fused into a friendship. Somehow, though, their paths continued to cross, and whether he liked it or not, John Parks couldn't help but get to know him as well as anyone. Oh, I knew him very well. Very well. I knew him at school. I knew him off school, and I knew him when he used to come round. I knew him exceptionally well. I described him as a ladies' man. He always went round with a dress suit on and a collar, you know, always very smartly dressed. He asked me one time in the garage, he, says, he said to me, do you like me? I said, I don't trust you. I told him that, straight to his face. John Parks wasn't the only man in Liverpool to share a distrust of Gordon Parry. To be frank, it was hard to find anyone who did trust him. Parks' opinion of Parry, though, wasn't just based on tittle-tattle or hearsay, but on personal experience. It was Parry's habit, as we've said, to visit the garage late at night. And he'd come up these stairs, and he'd come into the kitchen. He was in an insurance business, and uh, he was trying to get business, I know. But at the same time, his mind was on other things. He was wanting money badly. And he, uh, he tried to rob the son of the garage. Uh, he was caught going to a wardrobe where the son kept money. And after, after that, the boss said to, said to the son and me, close the door of my night and don't let him in. He says things are not safe. Parry's parents were comparatively well-to-do. His father was an official in the Treasurer's Department of Liverpool Corporation. Parry idolised his father, and in return it seems his father indulged his son. Somehow, possibly it was a present from his father, Gordon Parry had acquired a car. 
This must have done wonders for his flashy image with the ladies, but it did nothing at all for Parry's finances. John Parks remembers the car and the trouble it caused. I think it was a sweat, a little sweat. A matter of fact, uh, Atkinson's overall his engine for him. He overall the engine, he never got paid because he hadn't got the money to pay him. He had great difficulty in getting money off him. Great difficulty. It's hardly surprising that Parry found money tight. As John Parks has said, Parry was in insurance. He was an agent whose salary, including commission, amounted at the most to only about five pounds a week. It wasn't the kind of income to stretch to running a car and indulging his tastes in wine and women. But with Gordon Parry, pleasure would be served, and if he couldn't earn enough money honestly, he wasn't above getting it dishonestly. So it was, a couple of years earlier, that he'd been caught with his fingers in the till of his employers, the Prudential Insurance Company. He was some £30 short, and the men at the Prue's head office in Dale Street got to hear about it. Who told them? Well, there's no official record, but Parry had his own idea. The man who put the finger on him was the man for whom he'd been standing in during a period of sick leave, and his name was William Herbert Wallace. The £30 deficit was repaid to the Prue not by the petty thief who'd embezzled it, Gordon Parry, but by his father. It was a sizeable debt, but nothing compared to the debt that Gordon Parry owed to William Herbert Wallace. Not long after this, Parry left the Prue in disgrace, only to take another job in insurance, this time with a company called the Gresham. Not for the last time in his life, Gordon Parry had fallen on his feet. The story now moves to 1931, to the evening of Tuesday the 20th of January. As usual, John Parks left home in Tindwald Hill and made his way through a back entry to Atkinson's garage. It would be between 11 and 11.30. Among the regular nighttime callers who were welcome at the garage was a local beat bobby called Ken Wallace. It happened that PC Wallace called on John Parks that night because he had some news. News of the murder earlier that evening in Warburton Street, Anfield. He came into the garage. He said, hello, dear John. I said, hello, my Ken. He says, uh, there's been a bit of trouble in uh, Warburton Street in Anfield. I said, why have you gone wrong, Ken? So he says, uh, there had been a murder committed and Mr. Wallace has been charged with it. So uh, I said, that's Wallace. I said, he's Paris' friend. He said, that's right. So he says, uh, he said to me, I won't discuss it too much with you. He says, because he says, I'm a policeman. But Constable Wallace had already said too much. For one thing, PC Wallace, like the crowd that had gathered outside the scene of the crime in Wolverton Street, had got hold of the wrong end of the stick. Mr. Wallace had not been charged with the murder. He hadn't been charged with anything. Superintendent Hubert Moore, the detective in charge of the inquiry, had only arrived at the scene of the crime himself at 10 o'clock and wouldn't arrest Wallace for another 13 days. The word was that Wallace had been charged, but as with so many other fine points of detail in the Wallace case, the fact of the matter was completely the opposite. But John Parks had got it right, or half right at any rate. Wallace wasn't exactly Parry's friend, but he was certainly an acquaintance. John Parks may have mused upon the possibilities as P.C. Wallace said goodnight and moved off along his beat. But any musings were brought to an abrupt halt with the arrival some time later of Gordon Parry himself. What follows is the core of John Parks' story. He tells it in his own words as he remembers it more than 50 years later. Later that night or early morning, Parry came in with his car. I was busy in the garage. I was washing some cars down in the garage. And uh, he says to me, he brought the car in. He says, I want you to wash my car down. Well, his car was clean as far as I can remember. But I got the, I got the high power, high power hose. I went all over the car, underneath, on top, inside, in all the back, everywhere. And I had seen the glove there and I pulled it out. I pulled it out to... Uh, because that, that would get ringing wet and he snatched it off me it was covered with blood and I, he said to me if the police found that he said I, that would hang me so uh, I was a bit confused about things you know and then after that he started rambling again he said it looked about the bar and they said he knew where he was in the bar in a, a doctor's house he said he dropped the bar down the grid outside the doctor's house in Priory Road. 
But he was in an agitated state. I can remember that. I could tell by what, what he said. And when I was washing the car down, I knew why I was washing it down, and I didn't say anything. He said, I want that to wash down with the high pressure hose. And I washed all of it down underneath and all over. I realised me washing that car down had washed everything all away and the evidence was gone. But the evidence, the evidence was stirred on the globe, proved on the globe. And Paris saying, if there'd been a witness there, to witness him saying that the evidence there would hang him. And then he talked about the bar, or where he dropped it and everything. Well, I, re I remember that as clear as daylight, him telling me and all that. Let's look at this story in some detail, because if it's true, it's the most damaging evidence against Parry. Is John Parks really saying that as well as hosing the car on the outside, he washed the inside as well? Yes, yes, definitely. Definitely, without any shadow of doubt. Every particle of the car was washed where in other places they don't wash cars inside like I did. And he stood over me while I did it. And he was telling me where to do, what to do and all right. I went all over it. I went all completely all over it. The only thing that was suspicious I saw was that glove and when he emitted it was blood on it and it would hang him. And the glove was jutting out. Well I was putting the hose in there inside and all going all over and I, I got the glove out because I'd have saturated the glove if I'd have squirted on it and I, I didn't squirt on it and I had, pulled it out and Paddy snatched it out my hand and he said to me if the police got that he said that would hang me and I realised then he wanted me to swill the box out and the glove and all but I didn't I got the glove out before I started that. It was a, a thumb and all fingers. This, this part was all fingers and just a thumb. And I think it had a, I think it had, I'm not sure now, I think it had a little tear in it. I think it had a little tear in the glove. And I, I had what it, I had high thigh boots on while I was washing the soles, I didn't get wet. And if anything that came off the car, if there was any blood stains on it, it would have all gone down in the water, down the grid. The washing completed, John Park says Parry gave him five shillings for his trouble, and not long afterwards drove away. Sometimes he'd chat, uh, come to the garage, and he'd be there till three and four in the morning, then go home. Just nice, he chatted for a bit, and he took his car out and went. And then well, after, well, after all of what he told me, I was a bit worried, you see. And then that, that was when I told the boss. And the boss says, well, you don't have anything to do with it. I don't think I told anyone that, that night. I told, I, thought, I told the sons and the father in the morning what, I, what I'd done, you see, and how much Paddy had given me, you see. Because the five shillings, he gave me the five shillings. But it really wasn't mine, you see. It was a firm money. It paid, it paid me where he should have paid the boss. So uh, the, the boss said, keep the five shillings. He was a bit disturbed, but he said, don't have anything to do with it. And the son, when I told the sons, they didn't want anything to do with it because they were being advised by the father not to have anything to do with it. But I told uh, Mr. Atkinson, I said, if Wallace is convicted, I said, I said we'll have to uh, come forward. So he said, aye, OK. Well, Wallace was convicted. And uh, Mr. Atkinson said, I'll ring up Superintendent Moore. Well, he did ring up Superintendent Moore. And Superintendent Moore came to the garage. And I was explaining to Superintendent Moore about the glove me washing the car down, and where the bar was, oh, and he says, poo poo, he says, uh, I think you made a mistake. But certain people afterwards said to me, what you've told Superintendent Moore has saved Wallace's neck. He says, because the doubt crept into the case. Now, there's doubt in the case. 
But how, half a century later, can Parks be certain that all this happened when he says it did within hours of the murder of Julia Wallace? Uh, uh, I'm as sure as talking to you. The police, the police came round. They used to visit me in the night. And they come round early on. And now this murder, as far as I could know of, it took place earlier on. And then the police came round, Ken Wallace came round, and he told me about the murder in Ampil, and it was the Wallace's pal. He was very, very friendly with me. He used to tell me a lot of things that probably I should never have known. But there's another crucial point. If Parry had murdered Julia Wallace only hours earlier by beating her brains out with some kind of iron bar, why were there no bloodstains on his clothes? For the simple reason, the father worked at Ellis's, the grocer's, said, what did you think about Parry? I said, why, what's wrong? He said, he's borrowed a long pair of thigh boots off me. He said, he's going fish it. I said, that's strange. And then a policeman came in, who was very friendly, he says, uh, a friend of yours has been round to borrow an old skin coat off me. He said he's going fishing. So I thought, I know now why there was no blood on his clothes. I know now. He had, he had these rubbers, they never found them. The man that lent them never got them back. And the policeman that lent him his mat never got them back. So the suggestion from John Parks is that Parry went to Wolverton Street dressed in oilskins and waders, which he'd borrowed from people in Stonycroft, and despite his bizarre appearance, had persuaded Julia Wallace to let him in. He was dressed as he usually was dressed, and that's why uh, I couldn't understand why there was no blood on him. And then when, when I was told about him borrowing these thigh boots and mat, I realised then how, why there was no blood on him. Because he, he was that friendly with the Wallace's family, he could walk in the house, and if he walked in with his thigh boots on and his Mac, they wouldn't think anything of it. Quite how Perry managed to drive his motor car wearing fishermen's waders is one of many mysteries in the case. But the apparent improbability hasn't shaken John Parks' faith in his powers of recollection. Gordon Parry, he says, drove his car to Atkinson's garage with the express intention of having the evidence of his crime washed away. While I was watching it, I realised what I was doing. It's no use me saying anything else. I realised I was, I was washing that car and whatever evidence I was washing, I was washing away. And I couldn't do anything. I was afraid to stop. He's a dangerous person. I want to found the glove. That made me more afraid. I thought, my jingle, I'll have to be careful here now. And then he told me about the bar, where it was. And well, I couldn't, I couldn't pick that up on conjecture, where the bar was. He told me, he told me where the bar had been hidden, down the grid, outside the doctor's surgery in Priory Road. Well. <laughs> I, I don't know how many doctors were in Priory Road, so I couldn't say. He was in a state of insanity. He had to do. He had to tell somebody. He had to tell somebody what he'd done. He, he was that way gone, and he told told me everything. Now, if I'd have been a bit more wide awake, I'd have I'd have got more more out out of him. He'd have probably told me more. But all he was, con all he probably was concerned with, me washing that car down, and suddenly, and he guarded over it, and watched what I was doing, and the glove, and I remember the glove was like, I remember you now, and, and, and telling me about the bar. Clearly, if it is true, the story told by John Parks constitutes evidence against Parry, which, had it been followed up by the police, could have led to his conviction for the murder of Julia Wallace. If Parry was the killer, then Parry made the telephone call the previous evening to the Central Chess Club, where Wallace was due to play a match. The caller said his name was Qualtro, and left a message asking Wallace to meet him the following night at 25 Menlove Gardens East, Mossley Hill. Wallace, we know, on the evidence of some half a dozen witnesses, walked around the Menlove Gardens area for the best part of an hour, claiming to be looking for Mr Qualtro. 
whoever made the phone call put on a totally convincing act. Was Parry capable of such a subterfuge? John Parks has no hesitation on that point. He was such a liar. He could spin a yarn and get away with it. And he used to have a bad habit. He'd come up into the kitchen where we were and he'd take, pick the phone up and he'd ring someone up who we never knew. He'd ring them up and talk to him. And I used to say to him, we don't want to do that, Gordon. I'd say, you're getting people a bad name. And he was in the dramatic society and all, Gordon Parry, and it was nothing for him to alter his voice. He could alter his voice like you changing a shilling. If what we've heard so far is true, Parry came perilously close to confessing the killing of Julia Wallace to John Parks within a matter of hours of committing the murder. As Parks himself has said, it may have been that Parry simply needed to unburden his guilt by telling someone, anyone, about it. But in the days that followed, any guilt that Parry felt would have been tinged with fear, the fear that Parks may tell his story to the police. John Parks, realising this, began to fear for his own safety. These fears grew some time later when Parry reappeared at the garage. This time, he was not alone. After the murder and he opened his mouth on it to me, he suddenly come round with another chap. Then Miss Atkinson and her son said to me, you come down the back end here one night, don't you, to work? I said, yes, in the dark. Well, I never used to start until about half past 11. He says, well, you don't come down anymore in the dark. Let's look now at how John Parks' version squares with what we already know. We know that Wallace suspected Parry and made a lengthy statement to the police two days after the murder, telling how Parry had once worked his round while Wallace himself was sick. The statement goes on to give details of Parry's attempt to defraud the Prudential of part of his collection money. It points out that during this period, Parry got to know the Wallaces well and became acquainted with their domestic arrangements. He knew where Wallace kept the cash box, and he knew, or he thought he knew, the time of the month at which that cash box would contain the most money. Parry was invariably hard up. John Parks has said he had trouble settling his bills at the garage. When Wallace gave Parry's name to the police, we know they interviewed him. He claimed he had an alibi for the early part of the murder night. In fact, over the ensuing 35 years, he claimed a variety of alibis, each of them different, but the one that he claimed at the time involved his then-girlfriend, Lily Lloyd. Parry claimed he'd been with her, but we know that he'd only been with her during the later part of the evening. He couldn't possibly have been with her during the early evening when the murder was committed, because Lily Lloyd was playing the piano at the Club Moor Cinema. Last year, when we traced Lily Lloyd, she admitted that the crucial element in the alibi was false. She had been at work at the cinema, she had not been with Parry until later that night. Now, that ties in with the time at which John Parks has said Parry turned up at the garage. It seems conceivable that Parry saw Lily, possibly over a drink, once she had finished work at the cinema, dropped her off at home in Missouri Road in Clubmore, and then driven over to Stonycroft to see to the washing of the car, say sometime between midnight and 1am. What about the glove? Could Parry have concealed it from his passenger? More importantly, could a guilty Parry have concealed the torrent of emotions that must have built up inside him, having encompassed the death of Julia Wallace? Lily Lloyd says there was nothing in Parry's behaviour that night to suggest that anything was wrong. Yet, two years after the murder, Parry jilted Lily Lloyd, who promptly sought to withdraw the evidence supporting Parry's alibi. It's a puzzle, one that Lily Lloyd herself is not prepared to solve. Last weekend, we called at her home in the Isle of Man. She declined to discuss the case, wouldn't invite us in, and said if it were true that she's the only person still living who knows the truth about the Wallace case, then the truth would never be told. Gordon Parry himself is dead. Fifteen years ago, when he was living in London, where he worked as a telephone operator, Parry was challenged about his role in the affair by the author Jonathan Goodman. Parry laughed it off. The police, he said, were in and out of his home by the minute for two days at the time of the investigation. This is corroborated by one of Parry's sisters, Joan, who still lives in South London. When Radio City first broadcast its Wallace investigation last month, she wrote indignantly to the Liverpool Echo, claiming that forensic experts had conducted extensive tests on his clothing, even to the extent of taking the seams out of his gloves. Parry himself said the police finally seemed satisfied about his innocence when he was able to produce some people with whom he'd spent the evening of the murder arranging a birthday celebration. Goodman considered this interesting and significant because the caller, Qualtro, 
spoke of being busy with his girl's 21st birthday party. In 1974, Parry and his second wife Doris moved to North Wales, to the village of Llangurnu near Abergelly. His wife died two years later. Parry continued to work as a switchboard operator at a local hospital. He died in April last year, leaving a will proved at £18,000, but nothing to shed any light on the mystery of who killed Julia Wallace. We can find nothing to substantiate a story going the rounds after last month's broadcast that Parry had left a sealed letter at his bank to be opened after his death containing a confession. The conspiracy of silence surrounding Parry's part in the Wallace affair was born out of fear at Atkinson's garage in Moscow Drive and among the people in Stonycroft who knew that Parry had borrowed oilskins ostensibly for a fishing trip. They included a driver for Ellis's, a local grocer's, and a policeman. All of them kept quiet. Not one was moved by conscience to come forward, even as Wallace was brought, calmly protesting his innocence, to the brink of the scaffold. John Parks explains. They didn't want to get involved. There was a driver at Ellis's. He knew, and he didn't want to get involved. The policeman knew, and he didn't want to get involved. All the Atkinsons knew he didn't get involved. And people I spoke to, if it's someone who'd only backed me up, I'd have uh, come forward, I'd have uh, cleared Wallace. Wallace would never have been convicted. Only, only blood on the glove alone, never mind anything else. He's an old man now and physically frail. John Parks told us his story from a hospital bed, but says he fully appreciates the grave implications of what he's told us. I realised fully, and I wished I'd realised it more so at the time of the murder. After the evidence that Paddy had given me, and me washing his car down, I'd seen the blood on the glove on the bar in the grid. I was afraid of anything happening. Who is the left to back up his story? John Park says he told it to Mrs Dolly Atkinson, the young wife of Wilfred, one of the Atkinson sons who lived in the flat above the garage. Today, she's quite positive about what happened and when. I remember that uh, Mr. Parks told me that, and my husband, that we had, he had to wash the car. And uh, he said, well, you, it's a, you should go to the police. So he said, oh no, he said, you, you've got to wash that car. And I, I insist that you wash the car, you see. I hadn't seen the car. But I, I know that she told me that. It was the morning, yes, the morning after. Yes. Before he went home from his work, I saw sort of Pucker every morning. Like, uh, I mean, he's just like a friend to us all. And then um, he told uh, he told Wilf as well that uh, it had happened. We wouldn't make up a, such a story as that, you know, no, no. Uh, we've known him for years. Atkinson's garage is still in business. Today, it is run by Gordon Atkinson, Dolly Atkinson's son, and his brother David. Gordon Atkinson remembers his father telling him the story of Parry's car. This particular account of, uh, of the Wallace case was told to me by not only my father, but my uncles and anyone who was associated with him in, the, in the, that time. And it was discussed quite openly. As far as I'm concerned, everybody knew about it. The flat above the garage is still there, but now it's a store and it's no longer lived in. The garage itself, well, it's virtually unchanged since 1931. This is the garage where my father stated the car was actually cleaned. If you look up on the beam there, you can still see the, the washing equipment which was used and it's, it's never been taken down, you know, right from the very beginning. It's a swinging hose which they was connected to the mains and from there was the the hose with the the brush on the end that's that was the washing equipment but this is the garage which it's supposed to have been uh, washed out in gordon atkinson believes john parks's story he was told it by his father and has no reason to doubt his word unfortunately my father died 18 months ago and as far as i'm concerned he definitely wouldn't have made that uh, that sort of a story up it would be fact as far as I'm concerned. Regarding Mr. Parry, uh, he was known in the area as quite a, a bit of a villain. He was always chasing money, he was always chasing the women, you name it, he always had a, a finger in somebody's pie to make a quick pound or so. That also has common knowledge in the area. 
His father, being a well-to-do person in the in the council, was uh, another reason, I suppose, why he thought he could do just as and what he liked. Dolly Atkinson, too, is totally convinced that John Parks is speaking the truth. As far as she's concerned, Gordon Parry was the man who killed Julia Wallace. He must have done it because he wouldn't come and ask a car to be washed to a friend and make him wash it and wash the, everything that was uh, got the blood on. No. And I, I, I say that it was, it, it was him that did it. In 1931, Dolly Atkinson was part of that conspiracy of silence. Had Wallace's appeal failed, and had he returned to the condemned cell to be prepared for judicial execution, would she have encouraged John Parks to press his story? Of course she would. So would the others who knew it. No one is suggesting that anyone we've heard tonight would have stood idly by while the man they believed to be innocent perished on the scaffold. There was, and is, a second conspiracy of silence. It concerns the police who investigated the Wallace murder in 1931, and equally it concerns the police who in 1981 have said they are unable to cooperate in the making of these programmes. It's perfectly plain that the man in charge of the Wallace murder investigation, Superintendent Hubert Moore, was put on the trail of Gordon Parry at the very outset of the inquiry. We know that Wallace himself gave the police Parry's name. We know that the police interviewed him, searched his home and examined his clothing. And there's evidence that his car was also examined for traces of blood. We know that Parry's alibi was bogus, something the police could have discovered for themselves had they taken the trouble to check it. And we know the personal links between Moore and the Parry family. Moore's daughter Imelda was secretary to Gordon Parry's father at the city treasury. We know all this from various sources and documents, and it seems likely that most of these points would be confirmed by reference to the official police file on the case. Last autumn, during the researching of our original programme, we asked Merseyside Police for permission to look at the file. We were told that it had gone missing. On the evening of the broadcast, in fact, during the programme's transmission, a spokesman telephoned to say it had just turned up. The following morning, we again asked permission to view the file, but the Chief Constable, Mr Kenneth Oxford, refused. Last week, after interviewing John Parks, we renewed our request. Yesterday, the Deputy Chief Constable wrote back, confirming that Mr Oxford would not release the file, and adding, In view of the controversy aroused by your previous programme, it would be inappropriate for police records to be released as a basis for further public debate. What does that mean? What exactly is there in the file that the police are unwilling to reveal? Why, 50 years on, with Parry and Hubert Moore both dead, why is it inappropriate to encourage further public debate? Many, indeed most, of the people who had a part to play in the affair are dead. One of the most distinguished contributors to our original investigation, Wallace's solicitor, Hector Munro, died less than a fortnight ago, more convinced than ever that his client was an innocent man. He never heard the story you have heard tonight from John Parks, or his explanation for keeping silent for 50 years. Once I knew that Wallace, your neck was saved, I let it die away. I thought myself, well, I like, I like the others, I let it die down. But it's always, it always been on my mind all along. Even though it died down, I think I remember the facts so vividly that it's remained on my mind all the time. I think Wallace is an innocent man and he should never have been convicted. And I think Superintendent Moore made a mess of that case. An absolute mess of it. The controversy goes on, whether the police like it or not. The Wallace case will not lie down or go away and no amount of official bluster or reticence will cause it to. There are still people living today who know the answer to this mystery and the police could, if they chose, take steps to get to the bottom of it. We have done what we can and there, sadly and uneasily, the case must rest. Conspiracy of Silence was the third and final part of our investigation into the killing of Julia Wallace. It was written and presented by Roger Wilkes and produced by Michael Green and Wally Scott with studio production by Steve Kelly. Radio City would like to thank the many people who helped in the preparation of these programmes by giving freely of their time and knowledge of the case.